Welcome to Candid Leadership. Our guest today is Dan Ward, Senior Principal Systems Engineer in Defense Acquisition and Policy Department at MITRE. Dan is an innovative catalyst at the MITRE Corporation. He previously served for more than 20 years as an officer in the United States Air Force, where he specialized in leading high-speed, low-cost technology development programs. Dan is the author of three books, Lift in 2019, The Simplicity Cycle in 2015, and Fire in 2014. He holds a bachelor's degree in electrical engineering, a master's degree in engineering management, and a master's degree in systems engineering. Welcome to Candid Leadership, Dan. So, Dan, let's talk about your toolbox of innovation. I know you've done a substantive amount with critical and creative thinking, and I love the work that you've dug into over almost a lifetime about trying to help people understand ways to think innovatively. Yeah. Hey, thanks so much for inviting me to be on the show. I'm delighted to be here and and have this conversation. Yeah. Innovation has kind of been a topic of much of my professional life. And this latest book, The the Toolbox of Innovation, is just such a fun addition to this body of work. There are seven co-authors on this book, so I loved having a chance to do this work collaboratively. I deeply believe that innovation is a team sport, and we do it best when we do it together. And the other thing that's really fun about this book is it's written in the form of a choose-your-own-adventure book. So it's written in the second person. The reader is the main character, and the reader gets to make decisions throughout the book of using you know, this innovation tool or that. And I walk you through the whole process of building your team, developing an idea, trying out some prototypes, finding mentors, all the decisions that go into, you know, coming together to deliver some innovative product or solution to a hard problem. And it does it in a really fun way. And and the book's also pretty funny in some scenes as well. So delighted with how it all came together. So how are you using humor then? How have you found that it works to kind of connect those mental models together? Yeah. Oh, great question. You know, I think innovation is serious work, but we shouldn't take it too seriously. And I find that some, I mean, you say humor and and humanity. I think those two things go together, but bringing some humor, bringing some humanity to this type of work, you know, I think it really helps unlock our creativity. It makes it easier for us to, to work together in new ways when we're not like too buttoned up and too locked down and taking it all too seriously. Exactly. Exactly. And I love the the Choose Your Own Adventure. Some of us will remember reading those books in middle school. And then to another generation, it's totally new to them. So that's awesome. Middle school. I read them in college too. So <laughs> <laughs> There you go. Awesome. Well, let's talk about then your latest book. This is where the heart of the conversation is. Let's dig into that. So you are an avid writer. You've done it while you're both in uniform, post-service. And I find the fact that you've been able to balance it all pretty awesome. But this latest book, you really tie a lot of your thoughts together. You take people through history. You take people through hard problems. And then you also talk about diversity and inclusion. And this is not a new problem. So let's start to unpack Lyft. Yeah, great. Well, let me set the stage with Lyft a little bit. It is both historical and contemporary. It's it's whimsical and it's practical. And the book basically presents the story of aviation pioneers before the rights. So these are people who were designing, building, launching, and crashing airplanes in the late 1800s, so the decades right before the rights came on board. And, And I just parenthetically, I always try to refer to them as the rights, not the Wright brothers, because their sister Catherine was a full partner, a huge contributor, like she was in the mix. And in fact, I think it was Wilbur who said, if history remembers our contribution to aviation at all, I'm I'm paraphrasing slightly here, uh, it must remember our sister. So history promptly forgot their sister and only refers to them as the Wright brothers. So at least they're the right siblings (laughs) or or the rights, but to to erase her is, well, gosh, why why could we possibly have erased the, the sister from from history, you know, over the objections of Wilbur Wright himself. So anyway, the the book is about people who built airplanes and and did experiments uh, prior to their first successful flight in 1903. And man, aviation in the late 1800s was bonkers. Just these fascinating experiments that people tried to do. and, And they were trying to solve a problem that had never been solved before. That's part of what's so appealing to me about this set of stories. Trying to solve a problem where 
we weren't even sure if a solution was even theoretically possible, uh, and they did it anyway. And what's really fascinating is that these experiments, this, this approach to problem solving is directly relevant to so many problems that we're working on today in a variety of, of areas, not just technology, but socially and, and, and others. You know, we'd like to think that diversity and inclusion is something that was invented, you know, last year or, or in the, you know, in, in our age. Oh my goodness, they were dealing with and, and tackling these issues in the late 1800s as well. The most important line in the book says that the people who made the most progress, the people who came closest to solving the problems were the people who worked with the most diverse set of partners. So one of the big takeaways from the book is that diversity and inclusion boosts creativity, diversity and inclusion enhances innovation, and homogenous teams are just less good at solving hard problems. Diverse teams are better at solving hard problems. And that's not just a social opinion, that's a demonstrable statistical fact. So we go into some of that in the book as well. I think that's fascinating that we can even draw from history to show time and time again the fact that when you have diverse teams, it really makes a huge difference. It helps you think differently. You're more creative. I mean, your book, not only just it's steep with this, but also you have some really great drawings of these amazing flying machines. I mean, things that you wouldn't have expected and how they came up with this and crafted these ideas. Again, we see it from our mindset of, you know, hindsight is twenty twenty, and the airplanes that we see now and kind of the innovation going to the Smithsonian Air and Space Museum. And we see that modification. I do wonder what you see, kind of the thought in our lifetime, what are those really hard problems that we're dealing with now, designing our own airplane? Where do you see that? Yeah. Oh, great question. You know, I think we're, we're seeing it in areas of, you know, in the technology areas, AI, quantum, hypersonics in the military. You know, there are some really hard technical challenges. But even like right now, the, the challenge of building an effective hybrid workspace. We've never had to do that before. There are, are really answering questions that we haven't previously asked. So we're, we need to experiment. We need to really take a lesson from our aviation friends in the early 1800s. And for example, in chapter one, the, I tell the story about a guy named uh, Octave Chanute. And so he was a, a railway engineer at a point in time when the railway was really the the leading technology in the world. The railways were, were the internet of the age. And so he made his fortune on trains and then decided to spend the rest of his life experimenting with, with aircraft. And his approach to it was fascinating because he began by studying failure. So he wrote a book called Progress in Flying Machines where he basically documented 400 years of failed aviation experiments. So anything anybody had ever tried to do, he wrote it down and he analyzed it again with his engineering lens as he looked at these things. And he really had three purposes for this book. First was to determine, to satisfy his own curiosity as to whether flight was even theoretically possible. And he correctly answered, yes, it's, it's at least theoretically possible. The second was to identify the dead ends, the things we keep doing that are never going to get us there and we should just stop doing them, like gluing feathers onto your wings. Yeah, that's, that's unnecessary. We can skip adding feathers to our wings. I do love that. I do love that. Because, by the way, we beat our heads against the wall in multiple defense communities, and we keep doing the same things over and over. Keep going. Exactly. And the reason we keep doing the same things over and over again is we're not following Chinook's example. We're not studying our failure. We're hiding our failures. We're ignoring our failures. We're denying that it was even a failure. Right. And then we do it again, and it turns out, guess what? It's still a failure. So we keep metaphorically gluing feathers to our wings over and over again. And people did back in the late 1800s. They thought this was the way to go because birds use feathers. Well, we must also use feathers. How dare we do anything other than what nature intended for flight? Reason number three was to identify the most promising paths. Who's on the right track? Let's dedicate our resources, our time, our attention, our, our efforts in that direction. And so he correctly identified, for example, that that curved wings produce more lift than flat wings. And anybody, if you've ever studied aviation, you know, you know that the, there's this airfoil shape that sort of maximizes your lift. But this is a topic of, of great debate in his day. Should wings be perfectly flat or should they be curved? And he correctly identified like, yeah, curved is, is better. But he was only able to do that by having this rigorous, comprehensive analysis of all the things we had attempted, none of which had worked, but each of which had a, a seedling or a little bit of insight to teach us. 
And I think that's one of the big lessons of, from his work is that failure is never the whole story. Failure is often not even the end of the story. Failure is just the beginning. And if we start there, if we really study our failures, now we can make informed decisions about solving hard problems going forward. So I hope we'll do this. We're going to fail a lot with this hybrid workspace, this next normal. We're going to try a bunch of weird things, and some of them are not going to work. And we need to acknowledge that, huh, yeah, we, we thought that was going to make sense. We thought that would work, and, and it didn't. Let's stop doing it. But it really begins in, in being willing to, to acknowledge, to call something a failure, to study it and learn from it, and to say, look, look, this failure is not the end of the story. It's not the whole story. We're going to go do something else next. Right. And the catalyst for change. I mean, I think it's been pretty phenomenal. We had talked about kind of altering our workspaces, altering the design of the workday, being hybrid, locate, all of these things. They weren't new just as, you know, before the pandemic began. But now, because we faced a catalyst for change, it accelerated something. And I think, you know, I look at what are those accelerants out there that we just haven't recognized yet that are forthcoming as well. Always to be on the tipping edge of that is helpful, but it encourages growth too, right? We can look at the social structures, the way they're set up right now, and ask ourselves, we've enjoyed those of us who have had an opportunity every now and again. And unfortunately, a lot of us in the defense community persisted and continued But some people had that opportunity to spend a little more time with their families. And I don't think people want to give that up. They really enjoyed it. I mean, the grind was grinding families apart. The grind was tough. And just having time to, you know, sit down and become more involved has, for many people that I've talked to, it's been like a light bulb was turned on. And I think that is great for our society So I'm going to pivot a little bit off of that and talk about social things and society and the fact that your book is not available on Amazon. At the show notes and at the conclusion, I'll talk to you about where you can find Dan's great book. But there's a reason for that. And would you like to dive into that? Yeah, absolutely. I'm kind of getting back to my my punk rock roots. My first two books were both published through HarperCollins, a Harper business. But my second book, The Simplicity Cycle, I had originally self-published it. Before Harper Collins, you know, kind of gave me the book deal, and, and we did the, you know, the big traditional New York publisher type version. And after having done those first two books there, I decided for Lyft, I wanted it to be more back to my, I don't want to say amateur, but but a little bit of that, that amateur in the sense of someone who loves what they do. <laughs> don't get me wrong, I loved working with Harper Business. They were a terrific team, terrific organization. They really made the the first two books better. But kind of having that experience under my belt, I thought, let me kind of try and do this on my own, because this gave me much more flexibility in terms of timing and, and outlets and, and where it would reside, when I would finish it, all of that kind of stuff. And yeah, I kind of feel like I didn't need that sort of street cred that often comes with a traditional publisher. I'm like, I kind of did that already. And so I just, I loved the opportunity to kind of get back to some self-publishing roots. And that also gave me an opportunity to make sure like this is not available at kind of the big monolithic Amazon market dominating entities. And you can find it at smaller stores. You can find the, the audio, the ebook, the printed copy. But this is also, I think, consistent with the message of the book itself. Because the book is about scrappy innovators out in the back 40, kind of doing their own thing and trying to learn and experiment. And it just felt consistent with the book's message to take this different approach. I think that's awesome. And I do see how it kind of harkens. You you recorded the audiobook yourself. It's on SoundCloud. Guys that check out the website, chapter three is for free. It's pretty awesome. And it will definitely get you itching to buy the book, either listening to it through audio or buy it for old school, like I do, reading. It's pretty neat how you kind of tie all of that together. And I think it kind of speaks to you as a person, the fact that you take so much of what you do, Dan, and you're methodical in the way you think about it and very conscientious about how you've kind of shaped your life. And I see that in many different ways. And we're going to dive into, because this podcast is both about leadership and mentorship and the work that you've done in national security. And of course, going to Lyft, I mean, we're talking about your Air Force roots here. But throughout your career, we've had just an awesome opportunity to run into one another every now and again, and our paths have crossed. But what I've seen in you is a true advocacy for others in the workplace. And Would you walk me through some of your methods, what shaped you to be such a contributor in this space, and the fact how you continue to do it to this day? Yeah, I think I'm pretty aware that I was born into virtually every category of privilege that exists in this country. You know, like 
straight, white, able-bodied, neurotypical male, like all of these things. So all these advantages sort of automatically confer to me whether I'm aware of it or not, whether I, I like it or not, whether I want it or not, whether I even notice it or not. So I try to notice it. And I try to, as best I can, not take unfair advantage and to sort of help share and spread these advantages, to work together in a way that sort of brings people along and, and builds people up and invites people in. And so, you know, that is partly just kind of from a ethical, moral perspective, but also from my, you know, my engineering roots. Uh, you know, I've got three engineering <laughs> degrees and kind of all about the, the math and the science and the data and the experiments. And I've definitely found that, again, uh, homogenous teams are less effective at solving hard problems. And we do better work, more impactful, more important, more innovative work. But when we assemble a team that is just rich in multiple layers of diversity, uh, not trying to check some like minimum quota, hey, we got one person of this category, one person that category, great, we're done. Um, Bravo. You know, Thank you. Thank you. Get out and, and, to right. maximize it. and to never be satisfied with some basic minimum level of representation and, and inclusion. Again, I think that it makes it more fun. <laughs> Definitely makes it more interesting. It just makes it work better. And it's also the right thing to do. So all of those things together are something. And that's this. it's been a growing experience. It's, you know, wasn't kind of born knowing this. But the more I paid attention to the data and the experience, the more inescapable this conclusion uh, has been. And I think the fact that you can both be in those rooms to advocate for this, and this is the challenge that I post towards many of my peers and those of us who are a little bit longer in the tooth in national security or in the intelligence community is, when you're in the room and decisions are being made, who are you sponsoring? Because we can mentor all day long. And women are, we are, and in many ways, those of us who are out there, we are over-mentored and under-sponsored. And when I see people like Dan Ward, who are perpetually sponsoring people, whether they know it or not, and that's the part I challenge us, is when we're in the room, who are we working to make sure that they have that advantage? Who are we connecting? That's another one. I mean, network by design. I have seen some phenomenal people both inside of national security and even now that I've kind of walked into the cyber world and the tech space, what a difference it makes just to have a connection and to then say, oh, like minds, these two, they are working in two different sectors, but they have some great ideas. And if they converge together, man, that spark is going to light a fire. Dan is that kind of person. And can you think of examples in your career or kind of riffing off that idea that when we work as better sponsors, we get better results? Yeah, oh, absolutely. I think so many of the barriers that get in the way of people's progress and ability to contribute, these are designed barriers, sometimes explicitly, like deliberately designed and other times kind of unconsciously designed. But that means they can be undesigned. We can design other approaches. And Honestly, this is something I learned from my wife as a leader, as a decision maker in any kind of organization, like your number one job, the thing you should be thinking about from day one is a succession plan. Who am I preparing, not just mentoring, but sponsoring to take over and do this? Because I'm not going to be here forever. You know, whether it's a short military assignment or, or just the fact that, you know, we're only on this planet for a certain amount of time. Yeah, she really helped me, helped me see and understand just the importance of bringing people up preparing them to, to step into some of these roles. Yeah, really pretty much any project that I'm working on, you know, I'm, I'm doing the work, I'm doing my part and, you know, doing the decisions and whatever else is involved with, with that particular work, but always trying to make sure that, you know, I'm looking around who else is interested in this, who else might want to do this, who else can I invite in to be part of this, prepare them to open some of these doors. Exactly. Exactly. Because building your bench is so important, right? If we just take care of ourselves, and this is a leadership trait, regardless of whatever sector you find yourself in, if you're not looking around, and Dan, you said it so wonderfully, if you're not looking to your left and your right and saying, hey, who is going to replace me? Because we've got to think that's how great organizations continue to remain great. They grow their own, they develop, they invest, and they figure out how can I bring this either regardless of age, gender, doesn't matter who you are, when you come into that organization, how can I not only challenge you, make you better, teach you, and then help you replace me? Again, work yourself out of a job, right? That should be our objective. 
Absolutely. And then making sure that whoever replaces me doesn't automatically look like me. Yeah. And recognizing that like the person who replaces me, if it's just like a carbon copy of me, that's not doing anybody any favors. Oh, and I say that all the time, ducks pick ducks. So when we look at organizations who are unhealthy, you know, you can look at the wall and if every single picture looks exactly the same, and this is hearkening to the military here, on many walls and many leadership halls of honor, the walls look exactly cookie cutter the same. And so we're at a tipping point right now where we should look at that wall and ask ourselves, who do we leave behind? Who do we cut out, number one? And how can we make sure that doesn't happen in the future? And that really, that goes to a long, a long, long discussion on the pipeline and making sure that we keep a very healthy pipeline because it's important. There are critical junctures where the pipeline starts to leak. We'd much rather have a slow drip leak than a huge faucet leak that I'm starting to see currently with just the systems of systems breaking down. Talk about your systems engineer for this last year. And so how do we patch that and then get those people that fell out back into the pipe? I think that's my next kind of challenge and effort that I see us working on in national security. Yeah, and I think one of the first steps is for folks who look like me and kind of have my background and, and things to ask a really important question that I actually learned from Maggie uh, Feldman Pilch from, from NatSec Girl Squad. She basically said, if you didn't have to think really hard to show up today, I want you to think about that. Like if you didn't have to wonder, will I be able to eat the food? Will I be able to see the speaker? Will I be able to hear the conversation? Will I feel welcome? Will I look around the room and find like, you know, there are people here that make me feel welcome and safe. If you didn't have to worry about, there's a religious event this weekend that I have to kind of move around, or if you didn't have to worry about childcare or healthcare or any of these things, if you didn't have to worry about all of those things, I want you to think about that. Like recognize how this is a world that was built for for certain people and, and that these are designed barriers that could be redesigned and they are excluding people. And we all need to be more aware of these often invisible barriers. Because when I show up at a conference, I don't wonder, will there be food that I can eat? I don't have to wonder, will I have physical access to the space? I don't have to wonder, will anybody look at me and think, oh, I'm not sure he really fits in here? I fit in a, in a lot of places. You know, when she said that, I'm like, oh yeah, that's that's the message, that increased awareness. And really, this is just about, I mean, frankly, this is about seeing reality. This is seeing like things that are real in the world, how the world really works, that we've kind of been oblivious to for you know a lot of us for a long time. Right. And then making change happen, right? Opening the door for other people, being aware of it is the first part. And then and making that change. I think there's something else I want to pivot to that I actually read on your LinkedIn page, and that was about productivity. So as we kind of draw this awesome conversation, and thank you so much for coming on to the podcast, but let's talk about the productivity and some of the the grind work and the way that you've looked at both reconnecting, rediscovering, and then experimenting as you're kind of moving forward in your new space. Yeah, I am all about rapid iterative experimentation as a way to get some validated data to learn how the world works and, and what works in the world and to not be too satisfied with, with the results of an experiment. And one of the experiments I'm doing right now is to as publicly and, and clearly and widely as I can, let people know that I am reducing my productivity expectations for summer 2021. So I posted about this on LinkedIn. I'm talking about it with all my teams. I'm actually going to be talking about it with my boss uh, on Monday. And just to say, look, I am planning, expecting to be less productive this summer. And here's why. There's a lot going on this summer. This is a time of tremendous transition. You know, we'll be moving back into an office space, whatever that looks like in some hybrid-y kind of way that we can't even really define yet. I'm going to need some time to just physically move in <laughs> and then move back, however that works. I'm going to need some time to catch up with people in person who I haven't seen in person in like a year and a half. I'm going to need some time to catch up with people who I haven't spoken with in a year and a half, people who I would you know, run into in the hallway, people who I really like, and, and we just really always had you know, great conversations and did work together. But then we all went home and I literally haven't even spoken with them over the past year and a half. So catching up with these people, listening to their stories, as well as sharing my own. I'm going to be taking some vacation. Other people will be taking vacation. We should take vacation. And if those don't line up, then that just extends how long it's going to take us to get together, to collaborate and do all of these things. So 
And that's just the short list of things that need to happen this summer. It's a lot and it's predictably a lot. We know like we need to spend these time that we will be spending this time and something's got to give. You know, that's that's going to eat into something somewhere. And so I'm saying, look, this is going to reduce my expectations for my productivity this summer. And the funny thing is, uh, the ironic thing is, every time I've tried to do something like this, where I say, hey, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do a little bit less. I'm going to focus and just prioritize, do the important stuff, and, and kind of let some of the, the less important things fall to the side. Those end up being some of my most productive times, <laughs> you know, because I, I just yeah. dedicate my limited amount of time and effort and resources on one or two really important things. And then those end up being pretty <laughs> successful and, you know, and, and impactful and, and, you know, in the big scheme of things, productive. Um, but this is about being willing to sacrifice a little bit of near-term productivity to improve the productivity in the long run. We're not in this for a short time. You know, we're going to be around for a while, hopefully, to make sure I have that long-term productivity, reestablishing some of these relationships and behaviors and things like that. I think we need to, to scale things back a little bit this summer. And so I want to do that out loud. And I want to invite other people to join me in that. And I hope by doing it out loud, I'm, I'm helping to contribute to this idea that it's okay to do that, especially this summer. But we're not, not exclusively this summer, but especially this summer. It's kind of my, my intent with all of that. I think that's fantastic. And I think you've opened the door and given people permission to admit, hey, there are some things that we need to both reconnect with and then rediscover. I'll tell you in the workforce, when... Many of my fellow people that I work with, people who I've had the fortune to meet all during COVID time period, it was like the great unveiling. I mean, to see someone without their mask, it was like, I, I've never seen you smile. This is awesome. There is some goodness here. Like seeing the, the other half of your face is fantastic. And it's the fact that nice to meet you. Let's go have a cup of coffee. I mean, literally at work. I had a cup of coffee with someone that we have worked together pre-pandemic for, yeah, about a year and a half. We talked on the phone. We had done a lot of emailing back and forth, but I just hadn't physically met her. And I will tell you, talk about the spark. Incredibly productive. And we both talked about the fact, the way it impacted our children, the way it impacted the family, and it formed a stronger bond. So Dan, I am with you. And I think the greatness of this will also generate the second step. And that's when you start to really focus on what's most important. Where are your priorities? You know, the signal and the noise. There you go, Nate Silver again. Things start to just fade away. And where are we getting that true signal? You'll be able to pick that up, find it, and then discover so many things that are next. Dan Ward, this has been fantastic. Thank you so much for joining me on Candid Leadership. What a great conversation. Thanks. I really enjoyed every bit of it. And just one quick thought on the, the hybrid phase that we're moving into. It is new to in a big extent, but there have always been people that we've worked with and, and people who have been part of our groups who wanted or needed or would have benefited from some of these accommodations of the ability to adjust your work hours or work from home or, or you know, video into some meetings. Like that's always been the case. Now we're just seeing it because we're all, we've all been in that situation. So now we have to deal with it. So, you know, like the, the historical references that were still relevant today, these new hybrid challenges have always kind of been there. I'm glad that we're finally paying attention to it. And hopefully some of the, the benefits will continue to be implemented. Thank you so much, Dan. Thank you. That was Dan Ward, retired Air Force officer and now an innovative catalyst. Check out Dan's book, Lift, at www.lulu.com. That's L-U-L-U dot com. I really appreciate you listening to this conversation. And if you want more candid perspectives on leadership, go to colonelcandid.com. I encourage you to sign up for the newsletter where you'll receive the latest Candid Leadership episode notifications, writing, and links to other great leadership and mentorship content. I would also encourage you share this podcast with your friends, colleagues, and whoever you think could benefit from the information and wisdom shared by my amazing guests. I know I grow in every conversation and want to share that experience with as many leaders as we can. This show grows by word of mouth, so be sure to share this podcast. And please, if you think I've earned it, leave Candid Leadership a five-star review on wherever you find yourself listening to this podcast. Thanks again for joining me. I'm Colonel Candace Frost.